Welcome back. We are so glad you could make it today. This is Don't Touch My Sasquatch. We are the podcast that explores the mysteries of the cryptid, the creepy, and the unexplainable. We are and still will be your hosts. I'm Josh. I continue to be Lennon. You can follow us on Instagram at Don't Touch My Sasquatch Pod. Go to our website at DontTouchMySasquatch.com. If you're enjoying the content and you want to show your support, join us on Patreon for ad-free episodes, exclusive content, and much, much more. If you're enjoying the content, please like, share, and leave us a rating. This will help us to be seen by many more people. Everywhere. <laughs> Everywhere. Um, today and next episode, we will be talking about the Amityville Horror. Horror indeed. Yeah, this is going to be a dark one. It's going to be uplifting. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but before we get into that, Josh, I want to talk to you about something that happened last week after we recorded. Oh, God. Um, so we were listening to another podcast that they were talking about oh. pirates. Oh, you're going to bring it up. Uh, and uh, <laughs> to loosen ourselves up to be comfortable recording, we just kept saying pirate noises just to, you know, make it funny for each other. Shout out to uh, last, last podcast, podcast on the left, left and yep. their black beard. Episode got me freaking saying fantastic. R whole day. <laughs> R. So can you walk me through the events that happened the day after? Um, <laughs> do I have to? No. I do. Okay. <laughs> you should have said yes there because I'm going <laughs> to. Okay. <laughs> so uh, all right. All right. I, I went to uh, <clears throat> a gas station to buy an energy drink like I normally do every day. Get the drink and uh, go to the counter, cash out. The woman behind the counter says, have a nice day. And, and my, my response was, are you too? <laughs> and uh, I don't know if she heard me. I really hope she didn't. Uh, I didn't look. I just bolted out. Like, I cannot believe I just said that. <laughs> Yar, you too. It's so good. Gosh darn it. This is the funniest thing I've ever heard. You told me that, and I had to stop what I was doing because I started crying laughing. <laughs> oh, my God. I mean, I had to tell you. It was it's, it was too unexpected. Oh, it's so funny. Just, I can't imagine. You must have, like, ruined her day. Like, she probably didn't think of anything. Ruined. Anything but that the rest of the I day. I I made her day. Well, yeah. <laughs> She's really like, How many the people hell was wrong with this guy? Have a nice day. How many people are going to respond? Nar, you too. <laughs> it's like Pirate Steve and Dodgeball. Yeah. <laughs> oh, oh, God. Yeah, well, those are good times. Yeah, I good haven't times. haven't done that since, and that was very embarrassing. <laughs> I have actually not been to that gas station the rest of that week. I'm not going <laughs> to lie. I'm sure you won't go back. I'll go back. But. Yeah. Um, well, everybody hold on and cherish that laughter, because today's episode is going to be really dark. Um, First half of... Of the Amityville Horror. So, I will be covering the first family and the murders that happened in that fa- to the family in that house. Uh, it's, like I said, it's tragic, dark. A um, lot, of, lot of tough things to go through in this. Uh, yeah, so we're just going to get right into it. Um, the Amityville Horror House, the Amityville Murder House, because the horror was what they called the story that they... People were making money off of afterwards. The Amityville Murder House uh, it was located on 112 Ocean Avenue in Amityville, New York, but it's since changed to 108 to deter tourists. So here's the new address. <laughs> hey, yes. can we go visit? It's sure. not that far away. It isn't. It's like five and a half hours. Oh, you're giving away our location. <laughs> Put a circle around five and a half hours. Half of it's in the ocean, I know, but... That's where we are. <laughs> <laughs> we're coming to you from a submarine. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> 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 Boop. Boop. Um. Yeah. So. Nar. Nar. <laughs> nar. So nar. <laughs> so nar. Uh, you gotta gotta put in the laughs every once in a while because woo, this is gonna be it's a, a doozy. Dark. Yeah. It, um. Yeah. So the address has since changed to 108. So here's the new address for you guys wondering. And if you look it up on Google, you will not see it. No, it's blurred I out. I yeah. tried. Yeah, it's blurred out. But which is kind of funny because don't we all know what the house looks like in the area? It's, yeah, it's the most iconic house. So I think you, I think anyone could probably recognize it from a silhouette. Yeah. But yeah, Anyways. it's it's most notable feature is the quarter circle windows that kind of look like menacing demon eyes. So I've always 
thought that those windows are the creepiest part about the house, not not just given. I mean, even before I knew what happened in it. So the Dutch colonial home was built in 1925 on a quarter acre lot and sits on the water with a boat slip and a two car garage included. It's a five bedroom, four bath, 5,000 square foot home. And don't worry, the bullet holes have been patched. So it's back to being a beauty. <laughs> I guess so. It actually recently sold for over $600,000. When was that? Was that like a couple uh, years ago? Uh, yeah. Okay, so we're not talking about like... No. That's a lot of money. It is a lot of money. <laughs> um, apart from the quarter circle windows, uh, the mo- another more iconic thing about the house is the sign that they dubbed the home High Hopes, with the sign out front of the house when they moved in from Brooklyn. You got to have... I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm not going to sing. So, yeah, they dubbed it High Hopes. And I apologize for your ears for listening to that crap. Yeah, I got to clean blood out of that. So, no. <laughs> um, so who were they? Well, this is the family. The DeFeo family. They moved into this house from Brooklyn. The father was Ronald Joseph. I'll probably be calling him Big Ronnie because that was his nickname. His son is Junior, but we'll get to him. Big Ronnie was born on November 16th in 1930. He worked as a service manager for the family dealership, and he was known to be very abusive towards his family. Um, Friends of the family said that it was a wild house, and they didn't like to hang out over there because Big Ronnie would lose his shit on the family randomly. He sounds like a dick. Yeah, big, big old dick. Big dick, and not because he's large, if you know what I mean. <laughs> um, th- it was said, though, that his son, Junior, would get it the worst. So then you got the wife and mother, Louise Marie. I can't. I, I've read this a bunch of times. I don't know how to pronounce it. But I'm going to go with Briganti. <laughs> I like it. Briganti. Or Brigante. <laughs> Let's just go with Louise. We're going with Louise, though. <laughs> So she was born November 3rd, 1931. Uh, It said she wanted to be a model, but began dating Big Ronnie and got married shortly after. So her modeling career went out the window. And so did her confidence, it sounds like. Yeah. So her parents disapproved of Big Ronnie and actually stopped communicating with them until their first son was born. Her first son being Ronald Joseph Butch, nickname, DeFeo Jr. So he's the oldest of the five children. And the culprit to the story. Yes. He was born on September 26th, 1951. Um, he had a rough childhood, besides being bullied by his dad. He never seemed, he never could seem to make his dad happy or proud, and his dad would fly off the handle at him randomly. He has daddy issues, and that's tough. For sure. Uh, he was overweight, and um, he was bullied constantly and relentlessly in school about it. Um, he struggled with school because of this with bullies, and... His schoolwork in general was was not um, up to par. All of this combined, um, by the time he got into high school, he started to get into drugs, and he eventually dropped out at the age of 17. So we've got a real winners right now. Yes. Um, there was an incident reported at the trial um, following the events of the murders where one of the family members had said that they were over having like a family dinner and big Ronnie just got up out of nowhere and grabbed junior and started shoving him into the wall inexplicably and abruptly. He was known for being a punk and a druggie throughout the town. He admitted to the police during the investigation to being on heroin, LSD and other drugs frequently. He also worked at the family's dealership and half assed his way through getting a free paycheck every week. So a little bit on the dealership. I couldn't find too much information on it, but from my understanding is that it was Louise's parents' dealership. Gotcha. Um, Big Ronnie worked as the service manager. And Butch Jr., Ronnie Jr., Ronald Jr., Butch worked there doing odd jobs. He said he would show up late, leave early, take extended lunches, just so all so he can get a free paycheck every week. Lazy bastard. Exactly. His dad, part of their strained relationship, his dad had trouble connecting with him. And from stuff I read, they said that he just kept giving him a paycheck every week as a means to kind of appease him and try and, I don't know if it's to make amends, but just to keep him occupied, I guess, to get him out of everyone's hair. So after... <laughs> I scare you. No, no, no. After Ronald Jr. was Dawn Teresa DeFeo. She was born on July 29th, 1956. 
After her was Allison Louise DeFeo. She was born on August 16th, 1961. And then following her was Mark Gregory DeFeo, born on September 4th, 1962. Now, supposedly after Mark was born, Louise had left Big Ronnie, and Ronnie decided to attempt to write music to win her back with his words. Big Ronnie co-wrote a song called The Real Thing in 1963 where, when jazz musician Joe Williams recorded the song for his album One is a Lonesome Number. So his words actually charted. And supposedly it worked because she came back. So she came back and then they had John Matthew DeFeo on October 24th, 1965 to round out the children. So Five kids. Five kids. That sounds like your father. Yes. One off. Shout out, Dad. <laughs> six kids. Or five, six, yes. yes yeah. You have to count them? Well, I have, then my mom's got other kid. Well, yeah. I got a lot of siblings all together. Seven all together. All together. Yeah. Yep. But your dad has six. Yes, he does. He is potent. <laughs> <laughs> He's not going to like this. <laughs> Nobody knows who he is, so who cares? Yes. Um, so Louise's family. <laughs> She's going to just gloss by that. So Louise's family, um, she comes from money. Um, the Brigantes, mm-hmm. again, struggling with the name. They have money. Um, after John was born, they moved from their Brooklyn apartment to the infamous Ocean Ave house. So they bought this house. You're fine. Okay. I was going to go. Bam, bam, bam. <laughs> So after John was born, they moved into the from their Brooklyn Brooklyn apartment to the Ocean Ave house, and everyone kind of was looking sideways at him, like, "How'd you afford this house?" It's assumed that Louise's parents, who had acquired a certain sum of money, <laughs> had helped them pay for the house. I just like the phrasing on that. <laughs> gotcha. Sounds like I heard it before too. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, another. Big thing that is iconic from the murders is Ronnie had also liked the idea of having large portraits painted of each family member, which is also proposed that the Brigantes also paid for. So after one year uh, from ordering and standing for the pictures, it cost $50,000, and at one year later, the portraits would hang on the wall going up the staircase. $50,000? 50, 50 grand For fucking... Portraits? Well, they're Painted life portraits? size, but still. 50. That's, that's big pimping right there. That is. Um, big Ronnie's big pimping. <laughs> big pimping Ronnie. He didn't pay for it, but still. So apart from the portraits that were hanging on the staircase, um, Ronnie's friends had little Ronnie, Junior, Butch, Ronald. <laughs> All those names. There's a couple different Ronnie, Ronald, so. Which nickname are we going with? Big Ronnie is Senior. We got that one. Butch. Or just Ronald is junior. So all of their friends, the kids' friends, um, especially Butch Ronald Jr., especially his friends had noted had noted of these paintings um, being immaculate. The house was immaculate. Everything was kept tidy. was the fanciest fancy things. So they definitely tried to build up an image for themselves, which I'm not saying that they didn't have, but there was definitely problems at home. They played it up. Played it up, yes. You know, high hopes. I'm not singing again. <laughs> um, uh, the Ronald Jr.'s friends, uh, they f- frequently said that they refused and didn't like going over there because it was such an awkward situation with Big Ronnie Sr. Um, they just didn't like going over there. Uh, so they were always around town doing different stuff. They were often seen at Henry's Bar. Now, on the day of November 13th, 1974, the day of the murders, they were at Henry's Bar. At around 6.30 p.m., the ambiance and high spirits at Henry's Bar are interrupted when Butch bursts in to the bar screaming for help. As quoted in the Amityville Horror website, which, shout out to them for all the information given on this subject. They were very helpful. Gracias. Um, as quoted by them, the conversation went as follows. Butch was on his knees crying after he had screamed, and he was yelling, Bobby, you gotta help me. Somebody shot my mother and father. Bobby ran over and said, are you sure they're not asleep? And he said, no, I saw them up there. And Bobby said, come on, let's go. So, 
Billy had helped Butch up and recruited four others in the bar to help. The men were John Altieri, Joey Yeswit, Al Saxton, and William wow, Scardemaglia. Scarry. Scardemaglia. Oh, nice job. I think I nailed it that time. <laughs> Uh, they hopped into Butch's car, and they drove the short stretch down the road of the house, seeing as the the bar was literally a quarter mile down the road. Right. Walking distance, right? Walking, yeah. But they hopped in Bobby's car, and uh, Bobby had drove, and they said that he was racing down there as fast as possible. And they were actually yelling at him to kind of slow down. But um, so they get to the house. Bobby jumps out, and uh, he runs to the front door. Uh, front door is locked, and the guys are in the car yelling, "Wait a minute! Don't do it alone!" <laughs> wow, they sound like babies. Yeah, so they were in there yelling. But Butch had actually broke a window and got into his own house that way. He didn't have a key. Um, apparently not, because the door was locked. So he had broken in. That's how they figured out. Well, I mean, so, I guess after you kill your family, you don't think, "Oh, I better bring a key." Spoilers. <laughs> oh, or did he? Or did he? I mean, he was convicted. No, he sure fucking did. <laughs> Um, so they ended up, Bobby ended up going through the broken window that Butch had entered prior to going to Henry's bar, unlocked the front door, let everybody in. So Bobby led the group as they all went up to the second floor. He knew where the master bedroom was since he was there often, because as I said, he was his good friend. Um, as he stepped in to the master bedroom, he knew that the Fayo parents weren't sleeping. The dried blood, bullet holes... And Big Ronnie's back had put that theory to bed. Next to him, Louise was covered in a blanket, so her wound could not be seen. But there was still blood on the blanket. As Bobby was showing signs of holy fuckballs syndrome, the other men checked the other bedrooms. He likes holy fuckballs syndrome. No, he was starting starting to faint, starting to get woozy. So one of the other men like oh, helped him helped him down to the down the stairs and down to the first floor to sit down. Right. Um. Yeah, you know, you see the sight of the two parents there, someone you've known for most of your life. Yeah. Um, Big Ronnie, we'll, we'll talk about how they were found, but Big Ronnie was fully seen with two bullet holes in his back. Um, it was all visible. So the other men went and checked out the other rooms. Um, the boys' room was looked at next, and the two boys were found with similar wounds to the back, and they were dead. They were both... They were both dead. They were 9 and 12. At this point, the men decided to call 911 that there was nothing else they could do, so they didn't discover the, the sisters' rooms yet. So one thing that I find strange, not strange, but one thing that is very troubling about this case is that Mark, who was 12, he had a football injury. Right. So he so he had crutches and a wheelchair next to his bed. But the problem is, is that with this injury, I was reading something that said that he couldn't sleep on his back. He had to be. Sleep, I'm sorry, stomach? couldn't. He had to sleep on his back. Got it. He couldn't sleep on his stomach. So that'll come up later. But just remember that. Right. It's tough to think about that. We'll get into it. So the police showed up. Immediately, everyone in town was like, hey, um, check out the only fucking one who survived. He's a bit of a lunatic. Right. Uh, druggy. Uh, punk. So everyone's pointing the finger to him. So they decided to bring him in for questioning, as he would have regardless. Um, yeah, that's usually what they do is, I mean, if you have a whole family that's dead and only one survivor, they usually, that's the first subject. Right. So, ooh. Suspect. Suspect. <laughs> Not subject. Right. Um, so the following is Butch's story. Now, some of it is true. Some of it is most of it's bullshit, but some of it is uh, with most lies. Some of it has a grain of truth. And was this story told in court? This was told to the police the night of the investigation when they brought him in. Yeah. So Butch claimed that that day he had stayed home. Butch had claimed that the day before he had stayed home from work with a sick stomach. He dealt with the ailment throughout the day till the early morning around 2 a.m. He then claimed to have woken up around 4 a.m. and noted seeing his brother's wheelchair outside the bathroom. As I said, he had a football injury. He woke up feeling better the next day from his oh-so-terrible stomach boo-boo and left early for the <laughs> left early for work at the dealership like a good model employee, that which we all know he wasn't. Bullshit. Already. Yeah. 
So seeing as he had called in the day before and he was feeling oh so bright eyed and bushy tailed, he went in early. But then he left work early. <laughs> he grabbed some food and met up with his girlfriend and some friends. And he made a point at around 6 p.m. to call home in front of everybody to no answer. And he kept saying to everyone, I keep trying to call, but nobody will answer. I went by earlier. The door was locked. He's building up this story to everybody and making his alibi. So he'd called multiple times in front of them. Too much theatrics. Yes. After he had made a few more calls and made a point of it again, he decided he was going to go home and check on them. So he went home, and he, like I said, he broke in through a window because the door was locked, and he found his parents dead. Thus, the bar story ensued. After police showed up, they set up a base of operations in a nearby house and began questioning Ronald. So this is where his story starts to take off. He made claims of a mafia hitman named Louise Fellini, which I believe is a pseudonym at this point. Right. Um, being the family's assassin, he said that Fellini had lived with the family a few years prior after a supposed fight broke out between Butch and Fellini, which resulted in Butch calling him a cocksucker. Big Ooh. Ronnie, he, he was throwing some names. Big Ronnie revealed that Fellini was a hitman and that he fucked up in calling him that. Big Ronnie expressed concern for the lives of the family members going forward. You're a cocksucking hitman. <laughs> exactly. So this is what... This is what Butch is telling the police. Um, he's like, you need to be looking for this Fellini guy. You got the wrong guy. I have told you I've been out of the house all day. I was sleeping. Saw everyone awake at 4 a.m. So he's he's building up this picture that this Fellini guy is the culprit and that they need to be looking for him. Um, when the police were interviewing Butch, he had not a single good thing to say about the family members, which was damning to the police. So he was... He was calling them all sorts of names, talking about the shitty things that they had did, had done. His own family. His own family. The one that were murdered. Yeah, you are, according to his story, you just found them dead. You're probably about three hours post seeing them dead. That's finding fucking out, cocksuckers. Yeah, I hate all of them. Talk about how nasty. Will, I'm glad they're gone. Right, he's talking about how nasty his brothers were and sisters were. They would leave the bathrooms a mess. Obviously, he had issues with his dad. But, My dad um, used to hit me. God, I wish I could hit him back. <laughs> Wait. Right. I mean, I loved them. They were so great. <laughs> so that was kind of a very glaring, um, damning piece of evidence to the police. Um, after the police had revealed the butch that they had found the murder weapon to determine the time of the killings between 3 and 4 a.m., um, the f- police started to pressure um, butch into trying to back him into a corner. So they were um, Fellini's tail started wavering, and he started getting different, saying different things. Uh, he was saying that Fellini and another man actually came in and uh, forced him to watch them kill his family. Now completely moving away from the "I wasn't there at all" story. So Almost, he's starting to get bring himself closer to right. the yeah. Like he's lying, but you can't even keep your lies consistent, which is a key sign that you're lying. Right. So now he's saying that another man and Fellini had come in to do the job. Which we'll talk about because fucking fucking dog dog outside. (laughs) Holy shit. Little break for a dog bark, people. (laughs) I can hear the birds and I can hear the dog outside. (laughs) Jesus. We're recording in a zoo today. (laughs) Holy shit. (laughs) Uh, it's it's good to have that break of humor. <laughs> We're getting dark in a minute. Um, so yeah, so he started saying that, uh, like I said, he started saying that another man and Fellini were in there and forced him to watch as they killed his family one by one. Um, then the police started pushing. They said, "Well, were you coerced into helping with the helping them kill the family?" No, I volunteered. <laughs> exactly. Uh, he shamefully asked for a minute. Put his head down, and then he finally admitted that he had acted alone, and Fellini was not the suspect. Wow, he broke like a piece of glass. Yeah, this is all like the same night. (laughs) uh, It was somebody else. Okay, it was me. Yeah, exactly. He not that because he was condoning him lying. I'm just saying, right? But he he didn't like build this story up throughout the day because he thought he would have been golden on just I wasn't home, and then they were like, well, who? 
Where were you? Yeah. And he's like, oh, it was this guy. <laughs> because this guy actually did have a history with the family of living there. Um, the police actually looked into him, and he was had a solid alibi. I think he was in a different state. <laughs> gotcha, gotcha. Wasn't he like, uh, what was he, caretaker? What was he? He did something with the family, I remember. In my research, yes. And I he think frequently, he did. He was a lawns guy, right? He, yeah, he frequently had uh, sexual relations with the wife. I did not read that. Um, that was something that was brought up. That's a little up. steamy. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it was brought up in my section. It was like a quick blurb about mm-hmm. a vision uh, I think Kathleen had, which Kathleen Lutz is the family. That, we'll get into that in the next episode. But Part it's two. the family that moved in after this. Mm-hmm. That she had a vision of having sex with this person. and. Fellini. Well, there's no name, but well, yeah. And then I guess later documents proved that the big Ronnie uh-huh. talked to his lawyer about it and knew about it. Really? So, anyways, yeah, that's, I that's did something that was kind of brought up. Mm-hmm. But I don't well, know how true it was. Of course, well, there's another thing. But there was no yeah, names. So I don't know if it was Fellini. It just someone that lived with the family for a short time. Yeah, and helped take care of the house. Yeah, he did help them with different jobs around there. Um, I found the culprit. <laughs> He's the one who did it. No. Um, yeah, so the same night that they start investigating him, he breaks. Butch breaks. Yeah. yeah. Um, he starts admitting that um, what happened. Uh, he even told them where the evidence was, told them the full story, at least that full story of that night, which most of it becomes the accepted story of what happened that night. So... Yeah, right there, the case is basically, okay, all right. It should be a quick case. Right. Is it a quick case? I know we're going to be able to get into it, but. No. Of course not. Sort of. We'll oh. get into that, but. Well, that's confusing. He admitted, no, to, sort of. <laughs> he admitted to the police during the investigation that he was on lots. That was me. I had to oh. say Sorry. <laughs> Come in. <laughs> <laughs> he admitted that he was on lots of drugs. Um, and when he was trying to back out of the story saying that it was Fellini, He's like, oh, I was doing drugs, so if I told you that, then you got to believe that I would have told you if I murdered him, which he ended up telling him. <laughs> He's just up everywhere. So this is the accepted story um, mixed with the evidence that was found, mixed with Ronald Butch's actual for that night testimony. So the story goes that on the morning of November 13th, 1974, at around 3.30 a.m., Ronald DeFeo Jr. grabbed his 35.35 caliber lever action Marland 336C rifle. I am not a gun guy, so I'm hoping everyone who does know guns gets that <laughs> gets that information. Yeah, I'm not with you. I don't know guns either. So there's the specs on it. Uh, he then went to his parents' room and shot his mother and father twice in the back. His father had had evidence that he had tried to crawl forward but died shortly after they had a coroner i was reading yeah. uh, an article they had a coroner going through all these injuries that they had and kind of was giving like hey this is an instant kill this is moments this is he could have survived the 12 minutes such and such for the family members oof, 12 minutes sorry yeah it's oof so the first shot entered um his father's back and again the second shot did too um his father big guy like to probably sleep he was in just boxers so he's probably overheating. Gross. <laughs> Thanks for that freaking visual. But no, they had seen the the point of that is, is that his uh, waistline had been pulled down a little bit, as if he was trying to crawl away. Oh, that makes sense. Okay. So that's yeah, that's why. Um, two shots to the father, um, to his mom. She was found in kind of like a turned position, as if she was like raised off the bed and turned to look, like waking up. Yeah. Um, she got shot twice in the back too. The hell did she do to him, Dick? Yeah, coroners reported that she had might have woken up and turned towards the doorway to see her son at the other end of the rifle. Next, he went to his siblings' rooms. One by one, he shot each of them. He went to John and Mark's room next. Ballistics showed that he stood between the two beds and fired each of the single shots that killed them instantly. The boys were nine and twelve. Now, this is where I was saying that they were all fired. They were all shot. All these shots were to their back. Two, right. to, two to both parents, one to each of the siblings. Um, Mark's injury prevented him from sleeping on his stomach, so he had to sleep on his back. 
So yeah. he had to have either been moved to his stomach or woken up and told to move to his stomach. Right. Was he shot? He was shot in the back, like you said. So. Yes. Okay. Um, they were all face down. Um, they were shot from two and a half feet away. He stood in between their two beds. Yeah. They're nine and 12. He then went to his sister's room. Allison was shot from less than two foot away in the face and was found face down. Dawn, who was 18 at the time, was shot in the back of the neck from around two and a half feet away. Both dead instantly. Um, I'm pretty sure that it's going to get dark, but both of their wounds destroyed their face and heads. And there was... They, Gruesome. Yeah. Very. So... Those uh, weak stomach guys that were exploring, they never went to their room, so I guess it's good they didn't. Yeah. Because they only saw the back shots for the other two. That's bad enough. Any yeah. any shots are bad enough. Yes. But two, in, yeah, it's two to three foot away from each shot to the face. It's Ugh. brutal. Yeah, collapsed some of their faces. So Ronald then admitted to bathing, changing, and he left to discard the murder weapon and the evidence. Ugh. Yeah. How, how do you bathe and change? And yeah, he oh. just went on with his night Psychotic. after. Psychotic. Yeah. That's how. So this was 3.30 in the early morning of November 13th. Did no neighbors hear the shots? I mean, that's right. three, four, five, six, seven, eight shots. Two, Nobody four, heard. Six, eight, yes, eight shots. Yeah, exactly. We'll, we'll get into the shots thing in a minute because okay. that's where my special segment's coming up. Oh, puzzles. <laughs> um, puzzles. <laughs> um so the accepted story is that, that he did all that, did the murders, changed, bathed, discarded evidence. Then he started to build that alibi that he was talking about originally where he left for work early, mm -hmm. went to work, left, went to dinner, made a point to call everyone. Now, he obviously knew that they were all dead at home, so he made the story of the doors locked, they're not answering, come down to the bar, um... Broke the window, then came down to the bar and was like, hey, they done be shot. So. Despicable. Yeah. So shortly after, um, he admitted to the story. He was arrested. And then we get to the trial. So in the trial, his attorney tried to use the insanity plea, but the judge wasn't buying it since the day of the killings. He made a point to call home and build the alibi in front of everyone. So he played up the story he was building, and he didn't know why they weren't answering, which all showed intent, intent yes, an organization. So the insanity plea was, the insanity defense was thrown out. Clearly. Yes. Um, I mean, he was insane, but not that kind of insane. Right. And he was talking about it was drug-fueled and that, all sorts of stuff. He was on all sorts of drugs. He claimed that the morning... Of that, he was in a drug-induced fog on heroin, acid, and other drugs. Oh, that makes everything okay then, right? Right. Now, in the trial, this is where we started to get claims of the paranormal stuff. Finally getting into it. All right. So. Lay it on me, big boy. <laughs> uh, he had made claims um, of a demonic female entity with dark black hands. We had heard voices from in his head telling him that the family was plotting against him and told them told him to kill them. He even said that this entity gave him the gun and told him to do it. Now we're getting ghost guns. Yes, ghost guns. <laughs> so he just uh, it was a dark uh, female demonic entity is what he called it. And that was really the only paranormal that I've heard was during that trial. Right. I mean, could it? That might have stirred something up, but... Yeah. yeah. Um, so, yes, yeah, so the insanity defense was thrown out. Um, he At the end of the conviction... At the end of the trial, Ronald DeFeo Jr. was convicted of six counts of second-degree murder and was given six to 25 years to... Wow. Six 25 years to life sentences. Um, so when he dies, comes back, he's back in jail. Yeah, pretty much. Six... Six life second, uh, six it's consecutive a lot. <laughs> life sentences always can kind of confuse me. Like, yeah, I think I it's mean, more for uh, I don't know, reduce like so we can never get to reduce. Pretty to much, out. I think it's kind of a formality thing. 
Gotcha. Because he he was convicted of six separate. Right. You know, so I think it's more uh, of a formality thing. Maybe each each conviction yes. was a life sentence. So yes. then it was six consecutive. Life. Mm-hmm. Okay. I am not a lawyer, so I've just I've always been confused by that. Yeah, I think it's the formality part of it. Got it. Okay. Because say you got one of the get off topic here. But say one That's of fine. the murders, they could have been like, "Yeah, he didn't do that." Okay, so on five counts, he was five counts of life sentences, and then there's one count he found not guilty. You're still fucked. You're still fucked, but you're well, one one life sentence less fucked. <laughs> you are understandably and should be fucked. Yes, that's despicable and disgusting. Oh, yeah. He tried many, many times to, what's it called, parole? He tried to v- petition for to be out. Fuck that shit. Yeah, no. He got denied every single time. He tried it all through the years. Um, he was actually in prison here in New York for a while. Was. What part of New York? Was it? Uh, Stand by one. <laughs> what, what the heck? Um, uh, there's one by us. Um, there's one. That I know of. <laughs> um, it starts with an A. It's like the high, high facility for hardcore criminals. Rikers. Attica. Attica. Attica prison. No, he wasn't in Attica. Okay. He might have been. I don't think so. Well, don't say no and then say he might have been. That's confusing. <laughs> he was in prison. <laughs> I don't know. Um, yeah, so he got denied every time, which he was a fucking lunatic. So speaking of him being a fucking lunatic. Get fucked. Get fucked. <laughs> uh he liked to make different stories about what happened. He told so many people so many different stories. Is he like just prison. sitting in a cell coming up with stories, just whacking himself? Like, oh, yeah, that story's going to be Holy great. Holy shit. Didn't expect it to go there. <laughs> well, oh, man. Listen. Oh. This is a dark story, especially <laughs> it with, is. with everything that's going around right now as oh we're recording. God, yeah, um, it's no, not trying to make fun of it. No, or it's just but bringing want to make you a smile. Shitty, yeah, and, and yeah, it's a tough time. It really is. Yeah, so we apologize. We planned yeah, this story tough. for a long time. It's yeah, not. Yeah, this is not a. I mean, this was happening before what happened near us. Happened. Fuck. Um. How. Uh, how old's our country? Anyway, what <laughs> <laughs> you said this has been happening for? <laughs> no, it's not that old. Um, so yeah, he liked yeah. to make up different stories about what happened. Um, I'm gonna give you a couple of the stories that he said that are a little wild. I like wild stories, that's why I'm here. Yeah, so we're gonna start out with the one that he claimed his mom did it. So supposedly, according to him. His mom. Okay. So, I froze! <laughs> <laughs> no, so supposedly, according to him, Dawn, his mother. sister. Oh, sister. Louise is the mother. Oh, I'll yeah. get there in a second. Sorry about that. Dawn, his sister, had killed his father and woken Louise up. And she felt that the siblings and her kids and her couldn't live with the guilt of. And of having that family name afterwards or whatever. So she then killed Don, went through and killed the rest of the siblings, and then was going to kill Ronald, but Ronald turned, struggled for the gun with her, killed her instead. What a hero. Right? He's just a good guy. But he couldn't bear to have his grandparents find out what Louise did, so he took the fall for it. He's such a saint. Clearly. He's such a good guy. What? Piece <laughs> of shit. Yeah. So that was the story. Uh, he claimed Louise did it. The other one uh, was that his sister Dawn had been the mastermind of the whole thing. Um, supposedly, she was upset at Big Ronnie for being a an asshole, and two not letting her go to Florida with her boyfriend or move to Florida or go vacation. Something. Some reason she was pissed at him. Um, so she approached Butch about killing just Big Ronnie. That was the intention. But Butch was like, fuck that. You're kind of crazy. No. And she pleaded with him and was like, he's an asshole to you. Just come on, let's do it. 
And so he ended up letting her do it. And he was like, whatever. If you want to kill him, go ahead. So she ended up, Dawn ended up killing Big Ronnie. But she liked the taste for blood and turned the gun on her mother. Uh Yep. She ended up taking it too far and dispatched the whole family. And then was the, she turned the gun on Ronald, as with the other story. So this time it's the sister, not the mother. Turned the gun on Ronald, a struggle ensued, and he won the gun from her and killed her. Another I'm a hero story. Exactly. I'm going to call bullshit. Now, with both of these stories of Louise having to fight, of him having to fight Louise for the gun, him having to fight Don for the gun, he still would have had to take either of those bodies and place them in the bed in that position. So. Makes no sense. Right, exactly. So there would have been evidence of that, but... There was no blood found around the house like that. But according to ballistic and corner report, ballistic reports afterwards, supposedly there was unburned gunpowder found on Dawn's nightgown. Nightgown has no D at the end of it. <laughs> nightgown. <laughs> Nightgowned. <laughs> I'm a hound dog. <laughs> so there was unburned gunpowder found on her nightgown. Right. Doesn't mean she did it. Doesn't mean she didn't do it. But I definitely don't believe she did it. I definitely think Ronald's just a fucking lunatic and did it. Um, I mean, I mean, does the, how did the gunpowder get there? But, right. Um, again, I've actually never shot a gun in my life, so I really no not not one, not one, not one. I I've shot a couple. I don't know. You shoot one, it's all right. <laughs> I just never had the. the want to yeah it's not, not against that just never want to yeah so you see a bigfoot i, I still don't want to shoot him yeah you want to ride him <laughs> get on his shoulders <laughs> give me a whip i'm gonna str- <laughs> put a saddle on him and uh you almost said something <laughs> yeah <laughs> <laughs> i did almost have it a straddle <laughs> <laughs> oh shit i could just see uh, you sitting on his shoulders and just running through the woods. It's, uh, what the Fuck, uh, Yoda and, and Luke. <laughs> yes. <laughs> do yeah. or do not. So he, yeah, so he just built stories up all through his time in prison. Um, Ronald DeFeo Jr. died on March 12th, 2021 at the age of 69. 2029. <laughs> nice. First off, nice. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> nice. <laughs> uh, he lived too long. 2021. 2021. Yep. Yeah. Told stories all throughout. I, too long. Yeah, lived too, too long. long. But I don't believe in the death penalty because I think it's better to suffer in prison than to be given a quick, peaceful death. Right. Well. But at the same time, then it's more money than you have to pay. <laughs> you know what? I'm not for or against anything. I'm just going to stay neutral like Switzerland. Perfect. Um, I just wish he died sooner. Yeah. Just some kind of suffered, like, like yeah, some kind of suffering illness. Unless he didn't do any of this stuff and he was a patsy, then I'd feel bad. But I'm pretty sure he did all of it. Patsy, I'm like a that. patsy. <laughs> <laughs> Who was that? Uh, I was yelling that. Uh, Go, um, come on, you got it. I know. You the, got I know this. the JFK murders. I just can't remember. You got Oswald? this. Yeah, <laughs> I'm a patsy. <laughs> I'm a patsy. Lee Harvey Oswald. Oh, so much on that too. Yeah. On November 18th of 1974, Ronald Sr., Louise, Dawn, Allison, Mark, and John all had a funeral ceremony at St. Martin of Tours Roman Catholic Church where they had attended for many years. On sad ass, like, funeral. A family, too. Like, yeah. Everybody. There was Oof. over almost a thousand people were in attendance. 800 people packed inside of it, and 300 people stood outside of it. So, the family was was given a proper send off by many many people. So, Josh, it's time for. <laughs> you always come in hot when you go to the segment. I get scared. It's a good. It's like when you hit the like tab. It. It's like when you hit a tab on a paragraph. We need a little music. <laughs> time for puzzling puzzles with J and L. <laughs> it's puzzle time. <laughs> so these are just some questions I have. These are some puzzles that I have from thinking about this and reading about this. And I want you to give me your puzzling puzzles. This will go well. So, it will go fantastic. Shot in the dark here. I like it. 
Um, my pers- first puzzling puzzle. How did he kill all of the members of his family without the last ones waking up or fleeing to the gunshots? Damn it. No drugs were found in their systems during autopsies. How did he do that? I don't know. That's a, that's a good point. Yeah. Um, it was one I was thinking of when you were telling the story. Yeah. It's like um, the biggest glaring that, thing. That goes it. with how, like I said earlier, how did the neighbors not hear? Like, right. Gunshots are loud. Right. And the neighborhood was close together. So, And while no silencer was found on any in the property or on any of the guns, there was evidence that he was looking into buying them bef- months leading up to it, the murders. Well, if there was a silencer, obviously that like explains it. Um, but if there's none found... Yeah, there wasn't one. I, but I don't have an answer. I don't that's either. a question. That's why this is a puzzling puzzle. <laughs> yeah, it's puzzling. Yes. Um, yeah, how did nobody wake up? Yeah. Just from the first gunshot. Well, it sounds like his mother woke up. Yes, and I think... Oh, shit, what was it? One or two of the... Si- one, one or two of the siblings had evidence that they were awake at the time of the murder. I think it was his sisters, or uh, I think it was Allison, the one sister. But either way, at least uh, Mark, like I had said, he had right. been either flipped over post mortem or woken up and told to flip over. Which, so I'm guessing the brothers were the bedroom on the same floor, on the second floor. Mm-hmm. So he would have had to go up to the third floor for the sisters' rooms. Mm-hmm. Um. Yeah, no, I mean, yeah, it's the weird. brothers should have woken up right right when they shot the father twice. Yeah. At the very least, when they shot the mo- when he shot the mother twice. Mm-hmm. I don't know who this they is. They. He. <laughs> <laughs> and then he goes in the room and stands between their beds mm-hmm. like a fucking psycho. Yeah. And executes that. Like, yeah. How does nobody wake up? You're right. Exactly. That's my puzzling puzzle on that. Did, what, did you have any puzzling puzzles that what? I didn't cover? <laughs> Only thing I could think of is, so you said, oh, never mind. We disproved that. What? Well, he was, uh, he, he came, he locked the door. Yeah. Or he couldn't get in the second time after breaking the window Window the first time, but that was already disproven because he admitted he did it. Yeah. So, no, I don't have any puzzling puzzles, puzzles, and puzzles. It's just that's the biggest. But that's thing. a good one. Like, it's how does nobody hear that? No one, no neighbors. Like you said, there's. I, you got one, two, three, one, two, three, four, five, six people you're Can killing. Oh, sorry, I thought I was singing. You the got Beatles. six people that you're killing in three, three different rooms. Yeah. Yeah. It does six just people, wild. eight gunshots. Yeah. Houses are relatively close from what I remember from the pictures. Mm-hmm. They should have been heard. Yeah. And the others should have woken up and at least showed evidence of fleeing. Unless he was a straight-up lunatic and held them at gunpoint back to their bed or even moved them back to their beds post-mortem. It's some dark well, shit. I think there'd be signs of the... Right. Yeah, there's no blood trails or anything yeah. besides the blood splatter everywhere from the shots. I mean, that's... They got gruesome. That's straight-up puzzling. Puzzling puzzles with... Hey, no. It's puzzle time. <laughs> Um, did he hallucinate the demon? Do you think? Oh, was it a drug fueled? He was. Pr- I mean, we're gonna going get going to my story in a minute. No, no, no. going to my <laughs> not in a minute. Next week, um, <laughs> in my story, there was no female demonic. There was a female old lady, uh-huh. and then there was a pig man. Demon. Ooh. Um, yeah, no, I, I, I would believe he hallucinated it. He's on a concoction of a lot of different things. What was it, like four hard drugs? He yeah, was LSD, on? heroin. There's a great combination right there. Yeah, <laughs> all sorts of shit. Yeah, I mean, or he's just seeing as he lies oh, about yeah, so we, much. He right, he's just been lying about it. That trying was, to get out of it. Yeah, with the insanity plea. Insanity plea, which didn't hold a. F- Fucking foot. Which, in some of the, uh, I guess, conspiracy, or not conspiracy, but people think that the Lutz story Mm -hmm. was fake and made up to help him Mm -hmm. with the insanity plea. Yep. But there was no female demon, not demonic presence, Mm -hmm. talked about in the Lutz family. Plus, you have the Lutz who stuck to their stories and um, were agreeable on all of them. 
and then you have a priest. Mm-hmm. You have investigators after. You have the cops. We'll get into all of that, but <laughs> like, there's too many variables. People. Yeah. So, well, thirteen months later, the Lutz family would buy the home for eighty thousand dollars, and they would only last twenty eight days in the home. And we will pick up on that next Monday for part two. Eight crazy fucking nights and this isn't a christmas story <laughs> <laughs> yeah tw- 28 days that's not that long oh, i i would have probably left halfway through shit yeah i mean and they bought the house for 80 grand after eighty thousand. um they thought they were getting a deal and they didn't believe in the happenings yeah 13 months is a long time for that house to sit vacant a lot of, not a lot, but there's some patchwork to be done. Some blood to clean up, carpets to rip up. Yeah, it's hard to get resale values on murder houses. I right. assume. Did you? Yep. Did Did you see how much the the um, DeFeos had paid for it? I did not. I did not either. I only saw I was the. Curious Luxes. what they had paid for it, but they they had gotten a bargain. <laughs> We're eighty grand though, for that big of a house with a. Boat and launch and five thousand square feet. Yeah, it's a oh, good size. Half that quarter. The, yeah, it was the other thing about the boat launch. Uh, they bought Ronald Butch DeFeo Jr. a boat, a speedboat. Oh. There's another point where they were trying to appease him. Forgot about that. Here's a gift. Here's a gift. Here's a gift. Here's a gift, yeah. and I'm done. And you you kill all your family. Yeah, the perfect. Nice, nice. But yeah, so we'll pick up next week with part two. Um, it's been a it's been an episode. <laughs> a little darker, but just wait. Yeah, just wait. Next week just we're getting into some real creepy creepy paranormal activity territory. Thank you for listening. Be sure to check out our socials and our website for merch and info, all of which will be linked in the show notes below, depending on what platform you're on. I like when you said below, you said below. Below, because Apple Podcasts is below, because Apple's superior. <laughs> <laughs> and just get you going. No, nope. yeah, stay quiet. Sheep. <laughs> uh, we are on episode three with many more plans, so please tell a friend and leave us a review. Also, if you'd like to reach out to us, you can do so through our email at dtscast at gmail.com and let us know your thoughts. Join us next Monday for part two, and in the meantime, we urge you to stay curious, be vigilant, and remember, don't touch my Sasquatch. Don't do it. Peace. See you. Yar, are you Yar. ready to blow? I'm ready. Um, my note says 10,900 acre lot. Butch was on his knees. Fuck. Knuckles and knees, baby. Knuckles, Knuckles and, and knees. knees. Your fur feels good on my ass. <laughs> Come in. <laughs> he admitted that he was on lots of drugs. <laughs> Didn't expect it to go there. <laughs> well, oh, man. Listen. Oh, ba da ba I'm loving that. <laughs> Can you turn... The TV down. Poor favor. Good. I need a drink.